Welcome those of you that are online. So, so glad to have you with us today at Promised Land, wherever you are in the United States or world or Hayes County. Uh, if you're up the road, man, we're glad to have you. And everybody that's in the room today, thank you for joining us at Promised Land. It's an honor to have you joining with us today, each and every one of you. Uh, last week, we had Michelle Haggerty up here with me, and she painted these amazing uh, pieces of art. And uh, yeah, if you are um, interested, a couple of those are actually available to uh, for auction right now. And we're taking the proceeds of that auction and sending them to hurricane victims in Lake Charles. So a couple of them, well, actually all three of them are out front today. You can see them as you leave. Um, but a couple of them are on eBay. Uh, we're auctioning, auctioning them off. We'd love, love, love to send a good chunk of money over to Lake Charles. And you get an amazing piece of art to hang or give away or whatever you want to do with it. Um, and those of you online can uh, do that as well, obviously on eBay. The link's up um, on our social media and on our website. So um, we're in a series called How to Be Made Whole. And uh, if you want further uh, in-depth study, get my book. It's available today at the front as you leave uh, How to Be Made Whole. Um, it's also available online now on the major sites, Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. You can go to our website, my wife and I's website, which is mademeaningful.com. Uh, but this is a, a resource for you if you'd like to get further, um, further study in this topic, in this idea. And as I've been preparing these messages, it's been so hard. This week I was just, uh, I was just wrestling with this so much because it's not that I don't have enough content, it's that I have too much. And I'm trying to figure out what to say today um, and next week in little bite-sized pieces, but we're going to give it a shot. But if you'd like more, um, obviously the book goes into so much more detail and area uh, of this. But here's what I want to tell you today. God loves you. God loves you. God understands that you struggle. I mean, God came himself. Uh, Jesus Christ came and experienced the suffering of this broken world firsthand. So God understands that we struggle emotionally, physically, spiritually, um, every Ali you can think of. We suffer, don't we? I mean, we're part of a broken, difficult world. And I just want you to know that, that God understands. And we don't serve a God that was so detached from us that He's unrelatable. He's very relatable. He knows us. He loves us. He cares about us. And he doesn't just want to kind of patch you up. He doesn't want to put a Band-Aid on your hurt. God actually wants to bring healing to you thoroughly. He wants to bring peace to you thoroughly. From the very depths of your being, he wants to bring Wholeness. God is interested in wholeness, not just a patch here or there. He, w he wants to help you with thorough peace throughout your life, throughout your relationships. And so like an iceberg, you're going to see icebergs a lot. I mean, that's what the artwork is out front. That's what you see up on the screen. That's what's on the cover of the book. Um, there's a whole chapter dedicated to that, just talking about the amazing idea that we are like icebergs, that there's a portion of us that's above the surface that everybody sees, but there's a whole lot of us. 90% of an iceberg is below the surface of the water. And I don't know how much is below the surface for you, but we all have a significant part of us that no one sees, that we see and we're embarrassed ourselves to see it. We don't like it, whether... It's things that we've done ourselves, or it's things that have happened to us. But wholeness that God brings to us begins way below the surface of our life where no one can see. And he brings that peace throughout our whole being. And this is what I want. If you missed last week, this is it in one sentence. Wholeness begins with the faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the very beginning of your wholeness. If you want to be whole, this right here is the most crucial place to begin. 
to begin. Wholeness begins with a faith. Now, faith doesn't mean you have it all figured out. Doesn't mean you have all the proof that you need. Faith is something that is uh, the explanation of something intangible. We can't quite place it. We can't quite prove it yet. But we're placing our faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. He is the Son of God. And when we have that truth as, a, as just, uh, in fact, Jesus said it, just, it can be just a tiny, like the seed of a tiny tree, a mustard seed. If you, if you have faith that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the world, then you have something to begin with. So, so some people may say they believe in God. There's, there's millions of people that say they believe in God. But then when the pressure comes, when the, when the uh, brokenness of the world comes, it's actually revealed that they don't really have faith in Jesus at all. They're so distracted by the world. And sometimes it's not trouble that distraction, sometimes it's success that dis- distracts us. And, that, and that's really what Americans struggle with the most is that it's not that, it's not that our life all the time is just terrible and like we live in a third world country or something like that. But, man, we're so blessed with so many amazing things that we can get distracted. It can be revealed that we're just really about building our kingdom, not God's kingdom. It's almost like we have a Jesus bumper sticker up on the surface of the life that we have, and then down below, it's not really Jesus at all. It's ourself. So that's not what we want. And I feel like my job as a pastor, like if I have a job, it is to help people really come to that understanding that Jesus is your Savior, that Jesus is the one that's going to bring you wholeness that you need. So let's just spend some time with this. Let's just really dig deep uh, or go with your scuba gear down below the surface of the water and let's really say, God, is there any part of me that I have not surrendered to you? So if you're in that place, if you're ready and you want God to be your Savior, then it just begins with a confession of faith. That you make a declaration. And so in Acts, the second chapter, it says that the people hearing the message, kind of like you're hearing a message right now, were pricked in their heart. They were stirred up. And there was something inside of them was like, I want in on this. I want to be with Jesus. I want to serve him. I want to walk with him. And they asked, uh, you know, they asked Peter, what should they do? What should they do? That's Acts 2. 37, and, and then Peter tells them, okay, if you're ready for this, if you want to step into a relationship and you're believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then it's time to repent of your sins. So I want to encourage everybody to do that today. I, I'm going to give you that opportunity today to just say, Lord, I repent of me. I repent of this life being about me, about me trying to fix my life and prop my life up and make a name for myself and somehow achieve something that people will be impressed with. Lord, I, I repent of that. Um, and, so, and so I want to give you that opportunity uh, today to do that. And, and like I said, you don't have to know everything about Jesus to make that statement. It's just a statement of faith. We call it our confession of faith or our confession in faith I confess that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that he is my Lord. He's going to help me, provide for me, protect me, guide me throughout life. And so I'm making that statement of faith. That's where it begins. You're saying with your mouth, I believe in you, Jesus. Please forgive me of my sins. Make that statement of faith, that statement of repentance. And... uh, that wholeness process is going to start in your life at the very foundation of you. And then the Bible says the next thing that we're to do is to be baptized. And so if you have not been baptized into this new identity, into water, 
uh, it's a water baptism, I want to encourage you to do that. If you're looking to be made whole, if you want wholeness in your life, let's follow that next step of baptism. And we're going to be baptizing people here at Promised Land in the building, in our baptistry, on the final Sunday of this month. So I want to invite everybody uh, to go to our website that wants to get baptized, sign up for baptism, um, and, and we'll give you instructions. We'll teach you. We'll show you what to do. If you have any questions about it, we'd love to answer any questions that you have about baptism. Uh, but that's going to that's gonna happen. In Romans, the sixth chapter, says that we're buried with him in baptism. And just as Christ was raised out of that tomb, we also will be raised to new life. We'll be raised to wholeness in Jesus. So make that confession of your faith. I believe in you, Jesus. I don't get it at all. I don't understand it all. But I'm making a step of faith to believe in you. And then I'm going to be baptized into this new identity. And then, you know, what happens? What happens after that? Well, after you get baptized, we usher you away into a secret room where you live protected the rest of your life. <laughs> There's a secret cave that we all go to. And you never have to experience the world again. Oh, man. No, as soon as you get baptized, you get dried off and you go right back out into that ugly world. And there's a barrage of voices that come to us in that world that bombard us with these constant messages, constant messages that are against the Bible, that are against the Word of God. They tell you about what's good. They tell you about what's acceptable. They say you should look like this, and you should talk like this, and you should be concerned about this. Then if you're not concerned about this, you're a bad person. And they talk about things that aren't in the Bible. They tell you about what you should wear, what you should look like, what kind of grades, what kind of income you should have. I mean, these messages bombard us after we're baptized. A good example of this for me is when I go into a department store and I'm shopping around and I'll see this mannequin. And it's this fantastic, beautiful looking mannequin with perfect clothes on, perfect shoes and socks and pants and shirt and belt, coat, sunglasses up on the top of their head. And they're like going out to the pool, going out to the park, Whatever it is, and it's like, oh, man, this is what I want to look like. And I go to all the racks, and I find those clothes, and I find my sizes, and I go to the dressing room, and I put those clothes on, and I look in the full-size mirror, <laughs> and I don't look anything <laughs> like the mannequin. My body type is completely different than the mannequin. I mean, the pants are all bunched up around my ankles. My thighs are like bulging out and I can barely like tuck in and get the thing buttoned and the shirt sleeves are down below my fingernails and the coat's tight up here and long down here. Where are my chubby people at? Come on, stocky people. Where are my stocky people? Stocky's kind of a cool word to just explain, it doesn't work, you know, it just doesn't work. Now, those of you that are big and tall, you have some of the same problems, you know, it's hard to find shoes your size, it's, it's hard to find clothes your size, and those of you that are big and tall struggle too, but you have your own store. You have big and tall, owls big and tall, casual male, whatever. There's no short and fat store, there's no right? There's no chubby store. And so here we are trying to evaluate ourselves based on what we see. And the mannequin looks like Ken and Barbie, literally. I don't know if you've ever seen the comparisons. They, they actually did a calculation of the Barbie doll and said, you know, if she was an actual size, her waist would be an 18, 18 inches, chest would be like 39, waist 18, hips 30 or whatever. No one looks like that. But everybody tries to look that way. And it goes beyond that. You know, I was yesterday, I had to go to Austin 
and um, I, I had stuff in the back of my truck. I couldn't take my truck to Austin because I had some things in the back, and I was running late, and I couldn't unload it. And so I was like, well, I looked around. The only thing left was the minivan. And I sat there in my driveway, and I looked at the minivan. I was like, guys can't drive a minivan <laughs> by themselves. I literally thought, like, I can't take the minivan. Because guys don't do that. You have to have family with you, and that kind of makes it okay to drive a minivan. But man, I took that minivan. I was like, I'm going to take this thing. I'm preaching about this tomorrow. Come on, somebody. I got to take the minivan today. So I started driving up 35, and there's all these big dooleys and 4 by 4s driving by with these huge mufflers, you know, going by me. And they got things hanging off of them, and just crazy. There's all this pressure. There's all these voices. This is what's cool. This is what looks good. This is what's meaningful. This is what's popular. This is what is significant. This, this barrage of voices from the devil keep coming into our head and saying, you're not good enough. You're too ugly. You're too short. You're too fat. You're too tall. The life that you're living is, is not good enough. You're never going to make it. Your finances aren't going to make it. Your kids aren't going to make it. You're never going to make it. It's never going to get better, ever. That's the voices that come to us from the devil. At the same time, the voice of God is speaking to you as well, but we're so tuned in to the voice of the devil, we can't even hear the voice of God saying, I love you. You're mine. I've got this taken care of. I died for you. I shed my blood for your sin. I've forgiven you. Forgive yourself. I forgave you already. You're going to make it. It may look impossible, but I'm going to make a way where there seems to be no way. That's what God says to us. We don't hear it because we're so entrenched in the world. This is what Psalm 139 says. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and, and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. David was at a place when he wrote this where he was resting in his identity with God. And you know what's encouraging to me? You know, you know how the Bible describes David? David was ruddy. That's kind of like chubby. That's kind of like stocky. The prophet went to all of his brothers and said, no, 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 this is, the, this is the smartest, this is the finest, this is the most handsome, this is the tallest, this is the strongest, but that's not the one, that's not the one, that's not the one. Are you sure you have all of your kids here? And David's dad's like, well, I got one more. He's out in the back of the field, and he's the, the youngest and the ugliest. Get him. Bring him here. David rested in his identity with God. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. You know, the next time someone judges you or says something about you, you know, or you say something about yourself, you need to pray that right there. Lord, thank you for making me so weird, so different. Really what it is is you are just different than the way the world thinks you should be. But God made you that way. He loved you the way that you are. This coming Thursday is a, is a very important day for my family. This coming Thursday is the 19th anniversary of the year that my wife and I, this, th this coming Thursday is the day that my wife and I sat in Dr. Barry's office uh, up off uh, Medical Parkway in Austin, and we got this troubling news. You know, we were expecting our first child. My wife was 30 weeks pregnant. Everything had gone well. She was not sick one day of the pregnancy, not any morning sickness, a headache, upset stomach, nothing. For 30 weeks, everything had gone perfectly well until we got this sonogram and we went to the specialist and uh, they were taking forever. They were coming in and out of the room, in and out of the room and just couldn't, you know, figure out what was going on. We, they weren't telling us anything. And then finally they sent in another person and they said, hey, we need you to go to this specialist today because we're not seeing something we think we should see. And so we left that place. It was actually a community college 
that was doing free sonograms. And Sheila hooked us up with that. Shout out to Sheila. But at the time, we were children's pastors. We couldn't afford to pay for a sonogram. So we went to this community college, and we left. We're like, oh, man, why did we go to the community college? They don't know anything. You know, they're just students. They don't know what's going on. So we kind of arrogantly went to the specialist, and then, so this is the, this is the best neonatal obstetrician in Austin, and he uh, finally comes in there and says, you need to come back to my office. Well, I'd never done that before. I'd never gone to the doctor's office. I'd been to a doctor's office, but not the doctor's office office, you know, like the back, at the back. So we walk down this long hall, and we sit in his office, and he says, the thing that these people could not see is your daughter's brain. And so our world came to the screeching halt. These professionals that do this all the time could not see our daughter's brain when they looked at her head. And he showed us the picture. You should see in this circle, you should see all this brain matter. And all you see is just gray. That's fluid. That's called hydrocephalus. And she's most likely going to be born with all these very debilitating characteristics. And uh, you have a couple options, and he wrote them down on a piece of paper. And just the other day, this, I don't know, just like a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Eric and I were going through old papers, and we actually found this prescription. It's a prescription piece of paper. And I want to show you this um, up on the screen. At the very top, you can see the first option that he gave us. Consider termination, which means abortion. And uh, he said, you can't do this in Texas because you're already at 30 weeks, but you can go to Kansas and get a late-term abortion uh, if that's what you want to do. And then he gave us all these other options. Basically, you could either do that uh, or you can go to a C-section delivery in eight weeks, at, you know, 38 weeks of pregnancy. And so that's what we chose. It took us just a few seconds. We chose to go to birth. And, man, we began praying and praying and, and seeking God for this and just believing that God was going to heal our baby in the womb, believing that he had the power to do that. And every time we'd go to the doctor, the uh, prognosis was worse. You know, it's, the brain is getting smaller. The head's getting bigger. There's more fluid. And uh, just on and on. So we finally got to the day of birth at 38 weeks. And uh, they open up my wife. They bring out our daughter, Kennedy. They lift her up. And it's the best of times and the worst of times. A birth is amazing. It's a miracle. There's nothing like the birth. For those of you that have experienced it in person, it is unbelievable. At the same time, our hearts sank when we saw her head was so much larger than the rest of her body. We knew she wasn't normal. We knew she wasn't going to be healthy. And so they immediately whisk her off to the ICU, and they do an MRI. And then I'll never forget that. I'll never forget this meeting. It was like it was yesterday as I'm sitting here right now talking to you. We went to this little dark room with the, it's like an x-ray room where they show you the slides up on the glass or the light box. And they slid these scans up on the box. And it was Dr. Uh, Ronald Wilson, the, the best neonatal brain surgeon in our area. And he says, you see this right here? Uh, it's worse than we thought. Her brain didn't form correctly. So even if we drain the fluid, we don't know what parts of the brain are there and we don't know what's not there. And so um, basically kids with this condition live two to six months. Um, and, and there's a few kids that have lived a couple years. Uh, but we can take the, the fluid off. We can drain it off. And uh, it may make her feel a little better, but it'll do nothing to fix her brain. Her brain is going to be deformed the rest of her life. And so we sat there for a second, and we made another decision. We're going to do the surgery. We're going to make her feel as good as she can. Uh, and he said, this is, this is the words he said, you can take her home and enjoy her while you have her. So we did. We took her home. But uh, before we left the hospital, something else big happened. I was sitting at her, her crib, and um, I was, this was like three days later, um, I looked at the bottom of her crib was a clip, clipboard. You know, now there's computers, nurses enter stuff in, computer, doctors and computers. Uh, 19 years ago, it was a clipboard. So they were handwriting notes, and I saw then the doctor scribble, uh, 
the parents understand that their daughter will not have a meaningful life. And I read that, and I was so upset. I wanted to go lay hands on that doctor. (laughs) Not in a pastoral way. In a Chuck Norris sort of way. That's what I want to do. Like, how could you say that? How could you say that? And he wasn't trying to be mean. He wasn't trying to be spiteful. He was just displaying the human condition. We define meaningful by what you can do, by what you can provide society. If you can walk, if you can talk, if you can graduate, if you can join the band, if you can make enough money, if you can, you know, make a name for yourself, then, and I have never quite figured out what it would take for him to declare her meaningful. But um, I always thought, maybe I I saw that wrong. And for years I thought about that. And then I was like, no, I'm going to find that record. I want to just see if it actually says that. So 10 years after she was born, I went back to Breckenridge Hospital, and I went down to the, literally under the ground, uh, to this document place, and she brought up this stack of documents this tall. These were Kennedy's medical records when she was in the hospital, and she threw them down. She threw them, but she set them down like this big thud, you know. And I began to go through it. I had no idea how long it was going to take me, but I got to page six, and I saw this. Put this other thing up on the screen. This is what it literally said um, of the diagnosis. You can see. Uh, on the very last sentence, the parents understand that there's no chance, no chance, there's no chance of their daughter having a meaningful life. And my friend recently said, did you realize that that's on page six? And that's man's number. That's what man has to say about your daughter. But God has something else to say about your daughter. So here we are. She's going to be 19 in November. She's, um, I want to show you a picture. This was about a month ago in our, in our dining room. Oh, it's censored. Let's see if we can figure that out. This is us in our dining room. There we are. Now, you tell me, is she meaningful? When you look at that picture... That picture says more than a thousand words. That picture says you matter. You're significant. You mean something. And I want to I want to turn this message right now into something else. This message is not about you applauding my daughter or making me feel special because I have a special needs daughter. What I want you to understand is that Kennedy is our you and me. Kennedy is our mentor we all are on a journey to wholeness and she's already there there's a there's a text in john the 15th chapter the fourth verse where jesus gives us the way to wholeness he says if you will remain in me john 15 and 4 if you will remain in me i will remain in you. Now that word remain is not a very interesting word, is it? It's not a real like exciting, man, I can't wait to remain. I can't wait. I'm so excited about remaining. It's so simple. Because we're so geared to like, we want to see if you really try hard, I'll remain in you. If you'll really try hard, I'll do something for you. That's the old covenant. That's the Old Testament. That's the old way. But when Jesus comes, he has a new covenant for us. He has a new way for us. And the new way is you abide in me. You just stay in me. Just be with me. Be with me. And I will be with you. With you, if you're if you're longing for wholeness, Jesus is the one who's going to bring you wholeness. And the way we get to that wholeness, the way we get to Jesus being with us and making us whole, 
is for us to be with him. Be. Now, Kennedy is really terrible at doing, but she's phenomenal at being. She's a phenomenal human being. She's a terrible human doing. So much of us are so wired towards performing and doing, we think that's what we're supposed to do with God. We're so wired toward making a living and earning what we need in life, you know, the money, that we think that's what we do with God. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that God already did the work for you. It is expensive. It is costly. But Jesus does it for you. So now your role, now your thing to do is just be. Be in him. Now the next few weeks, and obviously in the book, I'm going to talk about being a child of God, being accepted by God, allowing God to be in control of your life. We're going we're gonna to dive into that and talk about that. But today I just want us to just rest in this idea that wholeness doesn't come from us doing or changing anything about our life. Instead, wholeness comes from being. Wholeness comes from being. As we go on our journey, we need someone to come alongside us. We need our Obi-Wan Kenobi. Come on, somebody. Y'all, any Star Wars fans in here? Luke's trying to go on his way. Luke's trying to make his way, and he needs Obi-Wan to come along beside him and help him on his way. He needs the Yoda to come. Kennedy is your Yoda. Kennedy's going to come alongside you. And that's really why I, I wrote the book was I wanted people to have someone to show them the way that's the most unlikely most unlikely person to guide you along the way. And so she's just a fantastic role model for us. In fact, um, I've often desired, this is going to sound really weird, but I've often desired some of her disabilities. And I just want to go through a list of four things right now that Kennedy has never done. The first one is this. Kennedy has never expected or required our approval, she just rests in it. She's never, that, that, this one right here could just, I could talk about this for a long time. How often do we require that someone like us or approve of us? I know you don't want to admit that and you don't want to talk about that because it's way below the surface of your life and you don't like to talk about these kind of things, but we have to. So many times we expect people to like us and then when they don't we feel rejected and then we feel a gap a hole in our life well you were supposed to like that post why didn't you you were supposed to retweet that why didn't you you were supposed to give me a raise why didn't you you gave that other position you gave that position to someone else and you didn't give it to me we we expect We require approval. Kennedy has not spent one second of her life doing that. Kennedy has never worked to belong to our family. She rests in her identity as a steel. She never has to impress me or my wife uh, to, to try to earn her spot. We often do that with our family Uh, with our peers, with our community, with God. We're working, we're striving to belong. You don't have to do that with, with God. Kennedy's a great mentor for that. Kennedy has never worried for one second about her protection or her provision. Just think about that for a second. What if you had never worried for one second about if you're going to make it or if you're going to be protected? Protected from a virus, protected from a burglar, protected from a, uh, someone that's not your race, protected from whatever. Never spent one second worrying. Never spent one second worried about if she's going to eat, if she's going to make it. She never worried about going into a complete spinal fusion on her back or uh, 
a reworking of her intestines. I mean, she's gone through so many surgeries. She's never worried about it. And I know what people often think is this is what I thought. Well, she doesn't do that because she can't. She's disabled. And I think, well, what a fantastic disability that would be. And do you know that God has done everything needed so you don't have to worry about that either? You don't have to be disabled to not worry about your protection and your provision. God's got this. He's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. And here's the last thing. She's never entertained or tried to earn our applause. Now, when you see her smiling in pictures, many of you are like, oh, her smile is so great. We love her smile. And let me tell you something. Kennedy has never one time in her entire life faked a smile. Not one time. We want her to smile for pictures sometime, and she won't. We're like, please, Kennedy, we we just paid a lot of money for this photographer, and we need a good picture. Please smile, please laugh. And she's just like, "Mm." But we turn on her favorite song. We turn on her favorite music, which is rap music. And when that bass starts hitting, she's like, I got something to smile about now. Come on. We're like, click, click, please, please. This is it. What if we never tried that hard to earn or entertain to get that applause? She just rests in it. She just is. She abides in who she is. And on the surface of her life, she's broken in many ways. But after you spend time with her, you learn In fact, just last night, my wife and I were in there for like 30 minutes in her room. And it was like a fountain of joy just coming out of Kennedy's being, smiling and laughing. And the reason that that's so powerful is because she has every reason in the world to be bitter and upset and angry. She has every reason in the world just to cry because she's in pain or she hasn't been, you know, rolled over or uh, adjusted or she's whatever. I mean, she has so many reasons to just be upset. But the fact that she doesn't have all of those extra mental and spiritual things plaguing her is just such an absolute joy to be around. Would you stand with me this morning? When I say it's time for us to rest, when I say it's time for us to stay, to stay in God, or just to remain in God. I'm not talking about being lazy or ambivalent or ignoring things or or just trying to act like it's not there to bring healing into your life. No, I'm talking about remaining in Christ, staying in Jesus. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Would you bow your heads with me right now? This is the moment where we make our declaration. And if you're like me, you've been making this declaration for a long time, but there's some of you that just at the very beginning stages of your journey with God, and that's okay too. The amazing thing with Jesus, it doesn't matter if you've been in this all your life or you just started, because Jesus is the one that's done the work that needs to be done for you to be whole and for you to be at peace. So you may be going through something right now that on the outside looks like there's no way you should be happy. There's no way you should have peace in your life. On the surface of your life, there may be some broken things that are really, really tough. I'm here to tell you today that with Jesus, if you will abide in Jesus, say yes to Jesus, he's gonna abide with you. And he's going to bring healing into your life. Let's go to him in prayer right now. And you can can say these words exactly as I say them. Or you can put them in your own words. I cannot pray this for you. As I say this, it's not for you. You have to do it yourself. And it doesn't necessarily have to be out loud. You can whisper it. You can think it. But I do think it's really powerful for your own ears to hear your own mouth confess. It is pretty powerful. So why don't you just pray with me right now if you're ready for this. Just say, Jesus, I come to you and surrender. I give up 
control. I need help, Jesus. I'm looking to you. I desire your wholeness. I desire your salvation. I can't do it by myself, but I believe with you I can. I don't understand it all, but I'm willing to learn. I want to begin this journey with you, God. Please forgive me of my sin. Please forgive me of things I've done wrong. I admit that I've done things wrong. I need help. I need someone to save me. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you're my Savior. I trust in you, Jesus. And I make myself available to you, God, that I would be filled with you. I would be filled with your Spirit. The Holy Spirit of the Lord, baptize me today, God. Bring wholeness to me today. Bring your beauty to me. Bring your love to me. Bring your peace to me from the most intricate and deepest parts of me. God, begin to paint a masterpiece in my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, let's worship.